research we do down at the clinic. And we're a, our official title is Human Integrative and Environmental Physiology Lab. And so what we end up doing <coughs> is a lot of mobile physiology. And I have a PhD in biomedical engineering, so my focus is on the technology that we would use in this environment and how we can bring that back. So um, when you think of human physiology and exercise physiology, this is kind of the image you get. You get a person on a treadmill and they're running and they're hooked up to all sorts of equipment and you're getting all sorts of vitals and you're trying to figure out where is their peak performance. Um, but what we do is we try and take our whole lab set up and we go to multiple places. And so we've been a lot of different places around the world, everywhere, um, almost. And from Air Force bases where we study, a lot of my work involves studying cognitive performance in F-22 pilots to elite breath hold divers in Croatia. And those guys can hold their <coughs> breath for up to 19 minutes. And, yeah, that's insane. I can't do 19 seconds. But um, we studied, uh, we've been up to Mount Everest, the South Pole, to Aconcagua, and I haven't been on all these trips. The boss has been around. He's been doing this for like 10 years now. And uh, we even studied a guy who swam the entire Amazon River, and we had him hooked up for part of that. So it's, it's, it's really cool. It's a lot of fun. But, you know, we work at the Mayo Clinic, we treat patients, so we have to somehow bring back the relevance to what we do. And um, a lot of these extreme scenarios, what they do is they model disease scenarios. So climbing a mountain is, and acclimating to altitude is very similar to getting heart failure. You develop fluid in the lungs, you get pulmonary hypertension. So what we do is we use these, first of all, it's a lot funner to study extreme cases than disease patients, but we use these extreme cases to model what we see in disease. And some of the things our lab does is exercise physiology, cardiovascular physiology, lung physiology and gas exchange, high altitude physiology. We do sensor validation, experiment design. We work with a diverse range of populations and we model lung and heart physiological mechanisms and we also create algorithms for disease trends and warning systems, both for military and for patient populations. So that's kind of what our lab looks like when we take it somewhere. It all fits in this tiny tent and that's uh, that's the boss. That's about as close as he gets to the work. Otherwise, he just sits there and doesn't do anything else. Um, so here are some of you, you. First, when you go out into the environment, you have to imagine that you're freezing. It's cold. Batteries on your equipment aren't working. Nothing, nothing is going to work like you think. And you have to still get the job done. So it's very important that technology is reliable. And if the theme of this conference is anything, it's that it's not reliable. <laughs> technology is never reliable. So we get a lot of sticky situations, but um, just a few minutes ago you were seeing an ECG single need on an iPhone, and that is one of the groups that we work with, that is SenseCore, and they build a athletic shirt that has two hockey puck sized hockey, two hockey pucks, basically. Yes, that's what I'll call them. And they sit right here, and they measure everything from breathing rate to ECG, full medical ECG, great ECG, and um, uh, steps, uh, how fast you're moving, everything. And they are a, they've been around for a really long time. So the technology, even though it still doesn't have to deal with FDA, it still is outdated compared to what's coming out. But they've renewed their technology, renewed their platform, and it's really exciting. And we're using them right now to study a group of uh, military trainers who are doing an underwater training exercise, so it's waterproof. So basically, they have them tie knots underwater and see how much stress it generates. And then they, do, they go through that training program, and they have them do their normal exercises, and then they figure out, well, after this underwater composure training, did they get less stress when they're doing their normal firing exercises? So it's a very fun project. We're just starting it now. We work with other groups like Jawbone, if you're familiar with them. They do wrist monitoring with their new one to develop their algorithms for detecting breathing rate and heart rate. Uh, we work with medical devices as well, uh, from groups like Preventus, Kaima, and, uh, and other ones that do heart rate monitoring. So this is what our typical lab setup looks like. So this is a guy, and we're monitoring his cognitive performance while uh, sucking the life out of him, basically. We're giving him less and less oxygen every minute. So um, we even <laughs> give them about 1% oxygen at some points, and 
Um, we secretly kind of don't tell anyone hope they pass out, get close to it, but we obviously safety is a primary concern. So um, let me kind of walk through what this person is wearing. Just uh, You can already see they have ECG and impedance uh, modules on their chest and their body, but on their forehead they have uh, a lot of duct tape. And what that duct tape does, it holds our entire apparatus together and it blocks out any ambient light so that our uh, laser detection nears and uh, pulse ox on the head can pick up signals. We also have a transcranial Doppler which uh, measures blood flow to the brain and it's a very painful device to wear. It's like a Mega Man helmet. You put it on and it squeezes and it looks, it goes mm, 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 and it looks for a place in your where it can get a blood flow in your medial cerebral artery. You don't want to do that. We pay these people though, so it's okay. <laughs> the, on their wrist you have a uh, a neck spin, which is a device that uses uh, pressure waveform to estimate your blood pressure and your heart rate. We have another pulse ox and we have your galvanic skin response. For those of you who are not familiar with galvanic skin response, it's uh, uh, almost your sweat response. And uh, it's used in lie detector tests to um, see if you, there's a reaction being evoked out of you. It's really not as good as <laughs> enough to be a lie detector because there's a lot of things that change your sweat gland response. So, uh, and we also measure eye tracking. And what we, while they're hooked up to all this, we ask them to be deprived of oxygen and play a video game that I really wanted to demo today, but I can't because I couldn't hook up my computer. That's okay, and they play this video game and we measure their performance to see how well they do. And uh, we track their eye movements and all that other stuff. Of course, we leave their left hand free so they can decorate it with all sorts of ceremonial bracelets from Columbia, but anyway. Um, so, on the topic of video games, why did I choose? I have a I love video games, I have a big background in them, but I was telling Patrick before this talk that the most demanding thing I've ever done in my life is to play some video games at a very high level. I used to play in tournaments and international level one was sponsored, and it's extremely difficult. And uh, there's a lot of talented young people who go out and play these video games, and it's a matter of life and death to them. But they're, the nice thing about them is unlike athletes who are moving around, they're sitting in a chair, so we can monitor them very easily. And we can take that information and translate it to what is essentially what has become our military's battlefield. This is what our military's battlefield is. It's all intelligence and it's all surveillance and it's all, don't call them drones, you call them RPA, remote piloted uh, vehicles, so RPVs. And uh, because they get mad, I've called it drones at conferences, they get very mad, don't do that. <laughs> so, uh, and there's a bunch of people sitting looking at multiple monitors, taking a bunch of information and acting on that for hours and hours at a time. Just like uh, people sitting in a room playing video games for hours at a time at a high level. You can't miss information, you're making many decisions per second. And, and so we use a lot of that in our work so we can help guide them to optimize their performance in that department and when their cognitive performance starts to drip, when fatigue comes in, and different uh, parameters. So, um, well, I think that's about all I have. I was going to show a demo here of what kind of how we use video games, but. Um, probably a good thing since our time is short. So, any questions? Love to answer. Um, yeah. Yeah. Could you talk more about um, the conversation we had earlier about just video games and how they how they kind of inspired some of your research and like where you came <coughs> from with, with video game playing and all that. Thing? Well, so um, it's uh, it it's interesting because. Uh, I always did really well in school. It wasn't wasn't very hard, but I played. My dad was kind of a really hard dude, and he would uh, never buy us a new video game unless we beat the one we had. And so we had the unfortunate <laughs> luck of buying really hard games as our first games. And so when we're like five years old, we had to really figure out these complex games. And so we always bought challenging games. And we, we I grew up in Lebanon, and there was no electricity 24 hours a day, so it was six hours a day. And so you come home from school and maybe you've got two hours of electricity and you want to beat Mario. And back then you couldn't save your game. I don't know how many of you actually play games, but you can't save your game. So you have to start from the beginning every time. So when you go to school, you sit down and you draw a map of how you're going to win that day. <laughs> so you strategically allocate your resources and your time and you try and get better and better. And then you graduate to playing competitively against other people online. And uh, the internet, there's nothing else in the world besides these games, maybe chess online and all that stuff, that you can play against increasingly more and more um, adept opponents without leaving your pajamas or your bedroom. 
And you know, if you're a great soccer player, you have to wait till you go to the nationals or to the to the regionals, and then from there you fly out to another place. But when you're playing games, you just keep playing and playing. You play against better and better people, and it's an intellectual battleground where you can keep sharpening your reflexes. So when we initially was contracted by the uh, Air Force to look into pilot health, and we had to outfit people <coughs> on F-22 planes, which are super cool, with monitoring equipment. We used a pulse ox and a belt. We came back and we realized we don't know anything, so we need to create a test that helps us see when one of these people performing. All they know right now in the Air Force is that after X amount of time, on X amount of oxygen, you will pass out. They don't know when you will start to perform poorly. No one has drawn those curves, and that's kind of what our work is. So the best way to do that is we created a game that's basically like the 40-yard dash of, of your um, mental uh, coordination, motor coordination. So if I take you and you play this game, this is going to be your score range. And after about 10 to 20 times, that's how good you're going to be, and that's it. You'll never get better until you practice for about two, three months, and then your, your motor reflexes will get better. And so that's like your 40-yard dash. If right now you go out and do a 40-yard dash, you can do it five, six times, you get used to the launch and the finish, and you'll get roughly the same time until you practice more and more. And so, and we really feel like we, um, we incorporate a lot of, I don't like to call it gamification, because, okay, I don't know. But anyway, uh, we incorporate a lot of game elements into our cognitive testing. How does that affect brain mapping? That's a good question. Um, we just bought a EEG cap, skull cap, that we tried to do EEG at the start in that study that you saw, mm -hmm. but EEG is highly complex, mm -hmm. and um, I don't have myself the expertise to do the analysis, so we've got an additional member on our team, and we just purchased a really cool neuro cap that uh, basically you put it on, and it remotely connects, and so you don't actually have to hook the EG, you just put on the cap. And so, uh, we'll find out, but I'm sure there are things that are there. But the, the, the thing about our research is we try and put it in applied environments. So, it's really hard to get a pilot to wear an EEG cap underneath his helmet. You have very limited real estate on Air Force pilots, so they have this helmet, they have their gas, uh, their, their oxygen tube, they have their heads-up display. And so when we were first asked to outfit them, we said this, they said, you only have this finger. Because <laughs> every other finger they use it, we're like, well, can we try using this finger? And so we had to convince them that we could use this finger and a place on the chest. So it's, uh, we try and keep final application in line, but we don't limit ourselves because we do do eye tracking and they don't think that they can put that on plane. I do think they can put that on plane. And I think they will in about two years. And, and so we try and keep it uh, applicable, but yeah, it's a very good question. It's very complex, and then if you consider fMRI research and stuff. So I mean, sky's the limit, but that's that's not really my domain. So that's why we're bringing in another expert, yeah, for sure. Cool. Hey. Yeah. Are you doing those testing in a simulated environment? Is that on the flight? Oh, so sure. Well, um, we've done cockpit in in air in air monitoring with mobile technology, but we also do. Um, study we do in an environmental chamber that can go up to 50,000 people. We don't take people that high, we only go up to 25,000 okay. where we have them all hooked up just like you saw and and then they actually do squats on a leg press while playing a video game. <laughs> the, it, it's ridiculous and these are, as bad as it is for the person sitting there, it takes us about an hour to hook up a person in these, in these, in these scenarios and the study takes about an hour. So it's almost as long for hookup and sometimes longer for hookup than it is for the study. And by the time they're comfortable and they're settled in, the study's almost over. Mm -hmm. But they are incredibly difficult studies for us to do because everything has to go right and it never does. And it takes so long and all these different parts are interacting. So if your gas, oxy your gas flow somehow craps out just a little bit, you lose that section of the study. If you lose your EEG signal, you lose your drop rate, you just many things on the head. Sure. One jostles loose, you lose a signal. So it's all we do in a simulated environment. So for in, the that in, in, that, in that testing, how big the population do you have? Oh, that's another good question. So for most research, um, you want a sample size of infinity, right? But we, it's very complex. So we stick to, in most of our physiological studies, between 10 and 13 people. So we use about a sample size, but we've done, 
different scenarios where we change small things. So sometimes we do hypoxia where we give you 8% gas, 10%, 12, 14% instead of the normal 21. Sometimes we do 1% uh, gas for five breaths. Sometimes we do added carbon dioxide. Sometimes we do hyperoxia, so 50%, 100% gas. So in total, we've done about 150 subjects, but they're just every 15 are a different scenario. Yeah, so it's, 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 but the individual physiology is so different mm -hmm. that I think you need, you need more because you and I can go through the same conditions and your oxygen saturation can drop to like 60% and mine will be at 80. That's probably not true, mine will drop because I was the lowest out of all our guys when we went to Everest. I was literally 55% for four days. So um, people's individual physiology are very different. How big their breasts are, how, they, how the oxygen gets distributed through their body, how much they react, do they breathe faster, they breathe slower. It's, it's really complex. <coughs> Do you think you could uh, uh, listen to a mobile device considering the algorithm software we have right now? Put say, what into a mobile device? So the device that you use for testing on people, so say consider a wireless device which does the same thing but uh, which is more personalized so you can get your personalized performance charts or something like that. Like uh, for day-to-day -day jobs rather than a demanding job like a uh, so course, yeah. the cognitive performance test you're talking yeah. about? Yeah. So, so say for software developers, if you have something like this, if you know when your peak performance occurs or something happens, uh, if you add a device like that, can, is that possible? Uh, Absolutely. I, I think it's possible. Um, I think it's something we're working on right now. I think that co cognitive testing is a complex field. There are, it's multifaceted, right? So we're looking at motor action pathways simply and executive function simply because we have a direct access point to them and I, I feel like we can measure them stably without a learning curve. But your job might not require much motor, but even though it is a good indicator of if you're lethargic or not, but it might not be what's most important for you in your job. And then how seriously do people take their testing too? We're actually adapting it to mobile. The reason why it's not on mobile is simply because we designed it for a, a mouse interface because we felt that that was the most direct way to test mechanical. It, it, if I could show it, it's, 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 a, it's a game that has uh, mathematical algorithms that generate boxes at certain uh, rates. And based on that, it'll modify itself based on your performance. But you click the boxes as fast as you can. So we adapted it to go up to Everest into a, a touchscreen environment. And what ended up happening is people would mash as fast as possible and their hand would actually obscure the vision of where the other boxes were being popping up. So we have to rethink it entirely to bring it to that scenario, but I think so, yes. The answer to your question, the short answer is yes. Long answer is it, there's multiple facets that need to be examined before we get there. Yeah.